talk a little bit about how um, he's led the effort in the intro, um, an intro um, to biological anthropology course to use OER um, and work with other faculty to make that happen. Uh, hey, thank you so much uh, for inviting me and uh, sharing my experience. Uh, so as I said, I'm an assistant professor in the uh, anthropology department. I've been at UPC for two and a half years. And I'm going to want to share a little bit of experience that we had in our department in developing a textbook free curriculum for introduction to biological anthropology. So I want to give you a little bit um, <coughs> uh, um, background about this class. Uh, this is, of course, a foundational course in our uh, curriculum, in anthropology curriculum. It's one of the many different introductions to anthropology that we have, uh, and this is like a subfield of biological anthropology specifically. Uh, it's, of course, a required class uh, for everybody who is a major in anthropology, but what is really important for us in this particular case is that it's also uh, part of the core curriculum. So it actually meets the life and science, um, and life and physical science component. So that means that we have a lot of students, because every time the students have to take a class for a requirement in science, uh, they see biological anthropology and say, oh, that's an easy one. And so I'm going to take this one, and then they realize that it's not that easy. But, um, <clears throat> but if we have a lot of students, so we could actually serve a lot of students, we'll see in a little bit. Another f uh, important aspect of this class is that everybody in our department that is a biological anthropologist teach this class across uh, the board. So uh, no matter if you're an assistant professor, associate professor, full professor, and we also have a lot of non-tenure track um, um, uh, faculty that are teaching this class, including some of our graduate students, particularly during the summer uh, semester. So we have a like, diverse uh, group of uh, faculty that has very different uh, experience. Just to give you some statistics about this class, uh, we usually offer between four and five different sections of this class uh, every semester in the spring and in the fall semester, and two sections usually in the summer. It's a little bit more variable during the summer, depending on availability of uh, teachers. Um, anthropologists don't really like to teach over the summer uh, because they actually go in the field. <laughs> uh, and so uh, we have a little bit more uh, problems to offer classes in the summer. But we do have roughly between three and 400 students that they take this class every semester. Uh, really fluctuate a little bit. Uh, we do have usually more students during the fall semester than uh, during the uh, spring semester. And so when we started thinking about uh, developing a class without a textbook, uh, we had two major goals. And first, uh, one of them was, of course, reducing cost, as we'll see in a little bit, and that's kind of common across all the uh, speakers today. And I guess it's one of the major uh, idea of um, OER in the first place. But the other one was also to try to create a textbook or at least uh, content that we could be uh, always up to date. Um, and we'll see that this specific on our own uh, discipline in a way. So cost reduction, just to give you an idea, uh, the cost of like textbook are very expensive. They're probably not as expensive as like bio or physics or other uh, textbook, but still they, they it's a range between 100 and $170. Uh, uh, probably a little bit less today if you can actually uh, get access to e-books and things like that, but still probably around like at least 50, 70, uh, uh, dollars per textbook. Um, since a lot of people are taking this as a requirement, we also to consider the fact that these students will never use that textbook again. Uh, they would never open the textbook again, even if they open it during the class. And that's just a question that we can discuss about it. It's a different workshop, though. Um, but uh, they will never really benefit from it after this class, very likely. Um, and so, given the number of students that we had, we estimate that between 30 and $55,000 uh, can be spent, technically, potentially, by UTSA student every semester for biological anthropology. So that's a pretty big chunk of money here. Um, particularly for, if you think about the demographics of our, uh, of our student. The other aspect that I think is very relevant about our discipline is that biological anthropology is a very fast developing discipline. 
you probably heard about like new fossils that have been discovered in the human lineage, or like new advances of ancient DNA in understanding how Neanderthal are related to modern humans and how we hybridize, or all the things about personal genomics and you know sending your saliva samples to 23andMe and getting the results and getting everything about your ancestry. Uh, and what you really are. This is all major anthropological question that we have that we want to share with the students and we want to talk about it in our class because they're really like related to their life in a way. Um, and so because of that, uh, we want to have the very latest version of a textbook that is always up to date. Because of that, what is happening is that um, it's also hard to find use because we always, teachers tend to use always the very latest version of it. And the old one can be actually not fully uh, useful for them because there are some parts that are uh, missing depending on who's teaching. So how this project worked out? Well, interestingly enough, I started myself uh, as an individual thinking about a textbook free project as soon as I uh, joined UTC uh, in uh, fall of 2016. And I really wanted to do it because of the reason above, but also because I teach this class in a very different way from any other person that I know. Uh, so I flip all the different topics around a little bit. And because of that, the textbook really didn't give me like a one-to-one -one correspondence between what I was teaching and what it was covering the textbook. So I was not really satisfied by any of the textbooks textbooks out there. We started developing a uh, first free uh, textbook free curriculum in fall 2016 for only one section. We eventually got a grant from the library uh, in the spring of 2017. And so by 2000, uh, the fall of 2017, we were able to apply our uh, textbook free curriculum to all the different section in uh, introduction to biological anthropology. So everybody that is teaching introduction to biological anthropology in our department today is teaching this class without a textbook. It's part of one of like, the things that we sort of made common across um, the full curriculum. So meaning that uh, since the implementation of this uh, particular curriculum, we have been told over 1,800 uh, students, meaning that we probably save around uh, $180,000 uh, for uh, these students because they don't have to buy a textbook. Uh, so the material has to be easy to find because at the moment there's no like a real good uh, EOR uh, for uh, biological anthropology. Uh, and at least when we started, there was almost nothing out uh, there in 2017. So what we created, it was create a sort of like a different set of chapters, a sort of like a virtual uh, textbook with different chapters coming from different articles that were available online. One of the very good resources was Nature um, Education Knowledge Project, if you're not aware of that, but uh, is a project by uh, uh, Nature, uh, the magazine, <coughs> that basically has uh, a lot of different section in a lot of different fields, including evolutionary biology and biological anthropology. And these are written by um, uh, scientists, by researchers, uh, but in a very, very easy uh, way. So they have different uh, levels, from beginner to intermediate to advanced, and so you can pick whatever uh, topic you like for your particular uh, and also we created a, a set of resources that are multimedia, so that we combine some uh, chapters and some videos together, so to give them a little bit also an experience that is multimodal to the student, more like than a normal uh, textbook. Um, when we were developing this class, they eventually published uh, this particular book, uh, The History of Our Tribe, of Nini. This is actually an open access uh, book. Uh, that is available. It kind of fills, fulfills some of the requirements that we wanted, so we use some of this chapter. Uh, it's very based on like the fossil record, so we don't cover the fossil record so much in details. But we actually use some of these uh, chapters as well as part of our uh, curriculum. And finally, um, oh, so you have an idea. At this stage, uh, <coughs> the, the text with the created is a better set of links that we can change and arrange based according to what we want to teach. We have a lot of different resources. 
uh, the major goal at this stage would be to create something that is more like a big uh, web page uh, where students can actually get and get all the information in the same place very easily and link to these different resources so they can actually uh, use it as a sort of a, um, uh, as a textbook or digital uh, textbook in that, uh, in that sense. Um, there is though now a book that has been uh, developed uh, and is in process to be released probably in fall uh, 2019. Uh, and this is a, uh, indeed a multi-order peer review open access book in uh, Introduction to Biological Anthropology. It should be available between the summer and the fall of this year. Uh, and it's also being supported, of course, by a grant from uh, Minnesota uh, State in this case specifically. So we might actually include this particular resource uh, as well in our, uh, in our curriculum. <coughs> Uh, student responses, generally speaking, uh, students have been really appreciated. I couldn't find really a lot of comments, bad comments, in my uh, evaluation or any evaluation regarding the fact that they didn't have a textbook. Uh, and I found a lot of students actually uh, thanking me about the fact that they didn't have to buy a, a book, uh, things like that. So I think that this is um, very important for the student. Uh, however, um, I want to also mention some of the challenges because I think this is really important, particularly when you don't have a very easy solution, when you don't have a real class like book that you can find open access and you're ready to go. Um, the main problem is that student needs structure. And these kind of readings that are a little bit sparse around the web might not give them like a full good structure to them. So it's very, very important that you organize them and you select them in a very, very uh, specific way. You provide them a way to get access to them as they would be like chapters of different uh, books. And also that those readings that you're actually selecting really introduce the student to the topic as a textbook chapter would do, in particular for an interclass, like in this case, because otherwise the student can get lost. Uh, so that's kind of a problem that we uh, find. It's not very easy to find the resources. One of the things that I've done uh, in terms of help some of the students is to provide an optional textbook the student can get access to if they really want to uh, uh, work on a textbook as a sort of a resource. Uh, so I'm not forcing them uh, to buy a textbook, but if they really crave the structure of a textbook, they have uh, an option. And the other thing is very important that some of the readings are comprehensive and self-explanatory because a lot of students might actually not attend class depending on your policy that you have in your class and you want to be sure that they can actually get access to that information even if they're not uh, attending, attending class. One of the benefits though is that I could really tailor my readings based on what I was actually teaching. Sometimes textbook just cover a lot of things that we don't necessarily cover, that we don't is necessary or we want to skip, I could actually select readings that were really, really specific based on what we're reading. So creating my own personal textbook in, uh, in that And so this is pretty much uh, what I have to say about Interplanetary Anthropology. If you have any questions, Yes. Um, so how the, so for the students, how does it, impact, have you seen any different results in how they do on text? And how closely are you assessing the lines of the material that they're getting since it's so variable? So actually, uh, I, we didn't do like a proper, uh, you know, pre and post survey in that sense. What I would say though that um, uh, I didn't see any decrease in their um, performance. Actually, I would say that probably I saw some increase, but not because of them specifically, but because of us. Mm -hmm. We were more careful about selecting the readings mm -hmm. and matching my, our readings to the material mm -hmm. and also be sure that they were reading them. Mm -hmm. So like testing them uh, reading by reading. So for instance, in my case, I have reading quizzes mm -hmm. for every single chapter that I assign. Mm -hmm. I think when you have a textbook, it's easier to just go like chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, but never really try to figure out if the students are using the textbook or not. Why? Because I was so worried 
that something would have happened, that they didn't have enough resources, mm -hmm. I really tried to be very careful. In that. So you're creating assessments around the material? I created an assessment around the material. Problem. And so that helped me to just be more careful. Yeah. Yeah. So I, it, I can do the comparison because of that, because it's not the only thing that I changed right. over the course of the years. Uh, but yeah.